John 15. John 15, 1. <coughs> John 15, 1. John 15, 1. Still hear some pages turning. Some of y'all still getting up. Some of y'all have quit turning, but you ain't there because you know I'm listening. No, I'm just kidding with you this morning. John 15, 1 this morning. Let Miss Melissa got one more to catch up here. Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me, and we'll suffer the little children. We'll wait for them, make them feel like they ain't no more or less important than anybody else. So now you stand on up there, and, and Miss uh, LaShawn, won't you stand up there and you can read off Dolly. John 15, 1 says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. <clears throat> Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing." If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire. They are burned. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word today, dear God. It's precious, it's needed, and it's good. And Lord, we pray and we ask God to you to bless your word today. Let it have its way among us today, O oh Lord. Let it have power. God, we pray today, O oh God, and we ask, O oh God, for the unction of the Holy Spirit of God. Help us today, dear Lord, to be filled with the Spirit, moved with the Spirit, O oh God, I pray. I pray, dear Lord, that you would do a great work here today, dear Heavenly Father. Pray, dear God, that you would move throughout us, dear God. Help me today, O oh Lord. Help me, O oh God, not to be pumped up with pride or to be puffed up with self. Empty me, O oh God. Fill me with your Spirit. Cleanse me, O oh God, of my sin. And help me, dear God, to be your speaker today, your messenger. And help me, Lord, to do your work. Bind Satan today and hedge this place, I pray, with your protection. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated this morning. I need your help this morning, if you will. I need you to... Uh, focus on me this morning. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions this morning. I want you to answer. You can answer yes or we'll just stick with yes. We always do amen. We'll just stick with yes this morning in your answers. Um, or you can say no if you want to, but uh, if you do, I'll probably throw rocks at you. But if you want to say yes, Please, by all means, say yes this morning. I want to ask you some questions, and I want you to answer them. Now, I want you to answer them audibly, and that way where everybody can hear you if this is what you want. Would you 
like to go to a church where you could ask somebody to pray for you and you know that their prayers are not only heard by God, but answered by God. Okay? Would you like to go to church where the people of the church loved God? I'm not talking about superficially. I'm talking about truly loved God and loved each other the same. Okay? Would you like to go to a church where everybody in the church possessed and manifested real joy where there was happy people. Well, if you said yes to those things, and that's the kind of church that you want to go to, then today's message hopefully will help you because that's the same. You've got something in common with God today because that's the same kind of church that God wants. And that's the same kind of church that God is trying to produce is a church where the people can pray and have answered prayers. And how many of you know if you knew your prayers were going to be answered, your prayer life would be more vibrant. And where people love God and love each other. And where people are happy, joyous people because the joy of God flows within and throughout them. That's the kind of church that God is trying to grow And here in John chapter number 15, uh, Jesus is giving an illustration this morning. Jesus used the things of nature to illustrate the spiritual things of God. And Jesus is using a spiritual representation here of a vine. Now you may say, now Brother Joe, why is Jesus using a vine? It's because they had just left the Last Supper and they was walking to the garden scene where Jesus was going to pray. And as they was going through the garden, I imagine they were seeing some vines there. The countryside of Jerusalem at that time had vines in it. And Jesus is helping the people or his disciples, that's who he's talking to here, his disciples to understand God's love for them and God's Uh, wants and wishes for them through the representation of a vine. In today's message, I've just labeled it as God's gardening of the church. Now, there is some things that we need to look at and we need to understand this morning. And that's three illustrations here that Jesus is using that we have to get across here this morning. Number one is the vine. We have to understand who the vine is. I think it's simple to understand if you just look at your copy of God's Word this morning where it says, I am the true vine. Jesus is the vine this morning. If you've ever been around grapes or wild grapes or anything like that today, you know that grapes grow off of a vine. Jesus is talking about the main conduit, the main, the main, uh, the one that's rooted in the ground is the vine and that's growing up and the branches come off of the vine. And what Jesus is saying is, he said, I am the true vine. Jesus is the one. The vine is the, the vine is the conduit of the flow of the, um, I'll use the word nectar because I don't know. Sap, there's the word I'm looking for. The vine is the conduit for the sap to flow through. And what Jesus is saying is, he's saying, I am the vine. And he's saying he's the conduit of the flow of the Spirit of God. Jesus is the conduit of flow. Now, he helps us to understand that he's the vine. And he wants us to understand that we are the branches. We're the branches. We're the ones shooting off of the vine. So therefore, the the branch, I'm going somewhere with this today. The branch has to be in the vine. The vine's not in the branch. The branch is in the vine. 
So we have to understand this morning that Jesus is calling us the branches because we abide. That word's over and over and over in there. You may have noticed this morning we sang a song. He abides. It's because we abide, we flow, we continue. That's what the word means. We continue through Jesus. The only reason we exist, the only reason that we have the flow of the spirits, because we are in the Son. John, or, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We're in Christ. When you get saved, God the Father takes you and places you in God the Son. You're in Jesus today. If you're saved, you're abiding in Christ. So he's helping us to understand that the branch receives the sap or the Christian receives the Spirit through the flow of the Son, Jesus Christ, and he is in God and we are in him. And then he gives us another picture here of God the Father. And he tells us that God the Father is the husbandman. Now, we can translate that word into our language today as he is the gardener. If we wanted to call it that today, the gardener. He's the caretaker of the vine. So we have to understand that real quickly this morning. We have to understand three things. Jesus is the vine, number one. We are the branches and we are in Him. That's important this morning. I'm going to get on to it in just a moment. We're in Him. And thirdly, God the Father is the gardener of the branches. So real quickly this morning, let's see what we can get out of God's gardening of the church. Out of John 15. Let's see what Jesus is trying to say. First of all, I want us to look at the Father's burden. He's the husbandman. He's the gardener. We're going to look at his labors this morning because that's the first thing Jesus points out. Look what he says. Verse 2, John 15. Every branch whereat in me that beareth not fruit. Say amen if you see that this morning. Amen. He taketh away. See that? He taketh it away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So here's some things, or, or, or uh, here's what we can see this morning about the Father, about the labors, the burdens of the Father this morning. The first thing I see is something that will give us a whole lot of hope this morning. And here's what it is. Is not only God the one who plants you in the vine, but praise God, he continues with you in the vine. He's a gardener. What else did we sing this morning? I'm trying to remember. Oh, I come to the garden. How many remember that? You think those were planned out by chance, church? I come to the garden. Okay, so he's the gardener, and what we're trying to figure out here is, is that he, after you're planted in the vine, and you begin to grow, then here's what you begin to understand, that the gardener doesn't leave the vine. That's good news right there. That's wonderful news right there. How many of you know today that verse in your Bible where it says, He sticketh closer than a brother. Uh, how many, I'll never forsake you nor leave you. How many of you know today that God the gardener stays with those things which He's planted? God doesn't save you. God the Father doesn't bring you to a place of repentance. Have you fall down upon your knees? Ask God for forgiveness and then He forsakes you, leaves you and says you're on your own. No, God is the kind of God that no matter where, oh praise the Lord, no matter where I go, no matter what I'm doing, no matter where I'm at, as long as it ain't sinful, He's right there with me. Amen? Amen. He's going along wherever I go. He, he, he rides in the car with me. He goes hunting and fishing with me. He can ride on a tractor with me. He goes with me to even to feed my beagle dogs sometimes. God goes everywhere that I go as long as I let him go with me. Amen? Amen? Why does he do that? Because he cares. 
He continues because he cares. I tell you what, friends, I plant a garden about every spring, and I plant a garden with the best of intentions. The very best of intentions. I love two things about gardening, planting and harvesting. I love to plant it, and I love to harvest it. Now, all that stuff that goes on in between there, I falter, okay? I uh, do pretty good hoeing the sucker out for a while, and then pretty soon it looks like grass with tomatoes sticking up here and there, okay? Maybe the corn's a little taller and everything else, and you got to beat down the weeds to find the fruit. I'm just being honest. Ain't you glad I'm not the gardener of your soul? Amen. I ought to go right there. God's the gardener of your soul. God's the caretaker of your soul. Because God the Father, not only does He continue, but He cares. That's why He continues. He's constantly. In other words, for Him to do these things right here that it's talking about Him doing, He has to constantly look over the vine. He has to constantly look over the branches. He has to constantly care. He has to constantly watch out for. He's continually looking over the garden or the vine, I should say. Then nextly, notice what he does. Not only does he care for it, but God cleanses it. Now, here's where you find that at in your Bible. I'm not just making this stuff up. Look here in chapter or verse number two. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it. Say amen if you see that this morning. He purgeth it. Now here's what that means this morning. It means that he cleanses it. He cleanses it. Now, there's something we need to notice here this morning. I want you to look what it says. It says, every branch, say amen if you see this part here. I want you to stay in your Bible. That beareth fruit. He purgeth it. He cleanses it. And what Jesus or what God the Father is doing is, is God the Father is taking this, this, this branch that's barren fruit and He's cleaning it up. And why is He cleaning it up? Well, the reason He's doing that is, is because He wants it to bring, look down at that verse, more fruit. Then if you look on over in there, what you're going to find, you're going to find another phrase where it says, much fruit. You find fruit, more fruit, much fruit. It, because God cleanses it. Now how does God cleanse us? God cleanses us with His Word. He cleanses us with His Word. Alright, let me help you. Let me, uh, Help you out just a little bit this morning if I can. And we're going to see how God cleanses us. This is a real important verse right here. And how He purges us this morning. Um, let me get your attention again. How many of y'all in here ever growed a garden? Or how many in here ever raised a bike? Alright. How many of you know today what a sucker is? I'm not talking about a thing on a stick, kids. How many of you know what a sucker is? I remember when I was a young man, I would take jobs topping tobacco and as we topped tobacco I didn't mind topping tobacco I was really fast at topping tobacco where I was tall and I could top tobacco pretty speedily but I hated suckering tobacco I despise sucking tobacco and when you're topping tobacco people want you to sucker tobacco as you top the tobacco I'd go down through there breaking 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 I didn't even have to hardly look I could just do it by feeling reaching in them leaves but they want you to look down. Because every now and then, in between where the main shoot comes out of the vine, we'll say it like that, or out of the stalk, there, right in between there, there'll be this little thing sticking up out of there, like that right there, and it just looks like two little leaves. That's a sucker. And you're supposed to reach down there, and you're supposed to just break him out. Sucker and tobacco. If you didn't sucker your tobacco... Or if your sucker don't, didn't work good, you'd have suckers sticking up everywhere. Am I right? Yes. Now what do those suckers do? They do just what they say they are. They suck the life out of the rest of it. The point of growing the bike was to get big leaves. Amen? Okay, now suckers also grow on other things too. Suckers grow on fruit trees. Suckers grow on tomato plants. Miss May showed me that. You ain't garden tips. Talk to that woman. 
suckers grow on tomato plants. If you'll sucker your tomatoes, what you'll find is your tomatoes will get bigger, your tomatoes will get better, and your tomatoes will get abundant by the suckering of them. You sucker your fruit trees because a sucker sucks the life out of things. And what God's trying to do is, oh, here's where it's about to get good. God's trying to get the suckers out of your life, sucker. Y'all get that this morning? I had to throw that last part in there. Because if we're not careful, as we're growing in the vine, we'll find that some sucker will come along. I'm not talking about somebody. But some sucker will come along and we'll let it begin to grow in our life. What's the suckers in our life? It's the things of the world. The cares of the world. And if we're not careful, they'll suck the life out of us to where pretty soon we're not oh glory producing the fruit that we should be producing because we've let other things interfere with our life am i preaching this morning is that is that what we're talking about this morning and what's god want to do well god wants to be the gardener and he wants to reach down and he wants to pinch the suckers right out of your life he wants to pull the things out of your life that's Listen to this. That's keeping you from serving God as you should. He wants you to be the very best Christian. He wants you to be the very best, have the very best relationship with Him. God wants you to have a wonderful prayer life. He wants you to have a wonderful love with Him. He wants you the blessings of God to flow down and from Him. And we all want that, don't we? But what we got to watch out for is don't let the suckers in our lives suck the life out of you because, friends, they can do it if you're not careful. You can let the cares, the deceit of riches, the lust of the heart, all those kind of things suck the spirit suck the life out of you but let praise God let God nip it in the bud this morning how does he do it well here's how he does it he takes the old Christian y'all get ready he takes the old Christian and when he opens up the word of God and he begins to read down through the word of God then here's what or he hears the preached word of God and he hears the word of God either it's preached or he reads it then lo and behold, every now and then, and even as I'm reading my Bible, i got to say, ouch! God, that hurts. Because He's talking directly to me because the Spirit of the Lord, the sword of the Lord, the Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. It cuts and it divides. And here's what God's trying to do. He's trying to clean me continually with his word oh but praise god if i don't never open my bible up and read it if i don't never go to the house of god to hear the preached word if i don't fellowship with god if i don't hear his word then here's what will happen suckers will begin to sprout up in my life and pretty soon i'm a fruitless christian and that's what god's trying to guard us against here because fruitlessness is not what God's after. He's after fruitfulness, not fruitlessness. Because when a Christian gets fruitless, it's when things get bad. Now notice what happens. Verse 2, every branch. See, God's doing things. He's continuing. He's carrying. He's cleansing. And yet he's casting Look what it says. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Then over here you can find it in verse 6. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth. Well, friends, what does that mean? It means that God the Father is not going to allow the branch to be fruitless for a long time. You see, some people read that and say, oh my lands, if I don't produce fruit, I'm going to hell. That's not what that's talking about this morning. That's not what it means this morning. What it means this morning is, it means this right here. It means that we're going to stand judgment one day before God. The Christian will. And God's going to judge what we've done. That's talking about the trial of fire that the Christian will go through over there in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. 
And what it's talking about is it's talking about when it burns up the wood, the hay, and the stubble. And what God the Father is trying to get across to us this morning is, is you're not going to live your Christian life being fruitless. Because if you're being fruitless, over there in 1 John chapter number 5, you can find that there is a sin, a sin even unto death. And what's that talking about this morning? It's talking about God taking the fruitless Christian out of this world. You say, Brother Joe, now that can't be right. Why can't it be? Do you think that God is just going to allow us to do whatever we want to do with no type of retribution? No, God chastises us. He chastises us. He cleanses us. He purges us. Trying to get the things out of our life that we don't need in our life that's drawing the sap out of us, that's taking the spirit from us. And if we walk around in refusal to get those things out of our life, if we walk around with unrepented sin in our life, refusing to repent of it, hardening our heart, uh, we have not... You know what happens when you, when you have sin in your life? You lose fellowship with God. And when you lose fellowship with God, you don't produce fruit because the Spirit is not flowing. And you know what God will do directly? You pinch it off. You say, well, why would God do that? Why did God send Nebuchadnezzar to Jerusalem? Because they was fruitless. They had quit serving the Lord. Why did God allow the Assyrians to invade Ephraim? Because they were fruitless. They quit serving God. Why does God allow the things in the Old Testament happen? Because the people were fruitless. They quit following God. They had turned away from God. They were stiff-necked. God's hope was to bring them back to Him. Should we stand in America today and think that we're any better than people were thousands of years ago? Should we stand and think that we can be fruitless and stagnant and um, apathetic and lukewarm in our Christianity and think that God won't chastise us? If we're thinking like that, then we're thinking in a foolish attitude. Read God's Word. Look at what He did. He says, I am God and I changeth not. Friends, what God wants to do, when you hear the preached Word of God, when you read God's Word, He wants to clean you, to wash you, to cleanse you, to help you along your way. The Father's burdens. Well, if God expects us to produce fruit, shouldn't we kind of understand what that fruit is? The answer is yes. Thank you all so much. So let's look this morning, and we're going to see the fruit of the branches. We looked at the Father's burden. Let's look at the fruit of the branches. All right. So what is the fruit? What's well, the fruit of the Spirit? Where do we find that at? Go to Galatians this morning. Hold your place in John, but go to Galatians 5.22. Galatians 5.22. I need to put her in hyperdrive this morning. Galatians 5.22. How do you understand Scripture? Scripture explains Scripture. Galatians 5.22. Say amen if you're real, right there this morning. Alright. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Those, things, those uh, nine things are the fruit of the Spirit. So let's break them down this morning. You can break them down and you can find that three of those, love, joy, and peace, are expressions of the contained spirit. Three of them are expressions of that which is contained. So in other words, you can express love out of yourself. Love's inside, right? It manifests itself through our hands, doesn't it? If you love somebody, you, ex you hold it inside your heart. You boys will get a hold of this when you get just a little bit older. Let me tell you, I was in love a lot when I was in school. Just nobody knew about it, okay? <laughs> you have love inside. 
You'll have love inside of you. I think mine was more infatuation. But anyway, you'll have love inside of you. You can have joy inside of you. And you can have peace inside of you. But those things can be expressed on the outside. How many of you all today like to be loved on? Amen. I'll never forget as long as I live. Uh, uh, Melissa one time, what she did. I might have told this story to you before. I don't know. But she made me some cookies one time in a bowl. Melissa did. And it is in a... She, uh, she put them in a butter bowl. She ain't changed much. She put them in a butter bowl and she gave me them cookies, sugar cookies. And she said, take them cookies home. Well, she wanted me to open them cookies, but I didn't open the cookies. I just stood there with the cookies in my hand. I dumb then like I'm dumb now. All right, so I went on outside and I got my little pickup truck and I went down the road and I said, I'll have me a cookie. And I reached down in there, and I thought the cookie was kind of oddly shaped, but I never paid no attention to it. I was more worried about it being in my mouth. So I, I popped me a cookie in my mouth, and I went down the road, and I eat my cookie. I got home. I walked inside. I put the lid on my cookies, and that was I didn't see what they was. And I went inside. I got inside the house, and my mom said, well, you got in that bowl? I said, cookies. She said, give me a cookie. I said, okay, so I wrecked her my cookie bowl. My mom opened them cookies up, and she looked down in there, and she said, oh. She said, I don't think these cookies are for me. I said, why is that? And she rushed down, and she pulled out a big heart-shaped cookie. You see, because what she was trying to do was is she was trying to express the love that she had inside of herself for me, and she was trying to express it on the outside. Why did you stop that? <laughs> <laughs> trying to express it on the outside. And what the Bible saying here is if you got love on the outside, on the inside, it's going to come out on the outside. If you love God, then your love will be manifested outside. You're going to be a loving person, but not only that, but you're going to be a joyous person. How many of you like to be around sad, belligerent people? How many of you like to be around happy people? Yes. Amen. That's because joy is a fruit of the inside of an expected blessing. It's an expectation. It's an expectation. It's happiness over an expectation. And then finally is peace. In your Bible, here's what I want you to notice sometime in your Bible reading. When the Apostle Paul wrote to the churches, he always said grace and peace. He never said peace and grace. There's a reason for it. Because you can't have peace until you have grace. But once you have grace, then you find peace. you got to experience the grace of God before you get the peace of God. And when you experience the grace of God, then you'll get the peace of God down and with you. And until you have peace with God, you're an enemy with God. You're an enmity with God. But praise God today, if you're in Christ, you can experience love. You can experience joy. You can experience peace as long as you're in the vine. And then next we see, not only that, but we can see three more of these is your engagements with the community. Look what else it says. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. That's how you deal with people. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. My wife knows that I am the epitome of all three of these things right here. You all didn't catch that, I don't guess, this morning. But... Long-suffering. In other words, you don't get worked up easy. Gentleness. You're a gentle type person. Goodness. You're good to people. I'm not going to break all those down. It's your expression or how you deal with other people. Your engagements with the community. Uh, thirdly, I'm going to move on. Your emotions under control. Faith, meekness, temperance. Temperance. Here's what... You all know what faith is. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. Hebrews 11, 1. So what is faith? Faith is putting your trust in something that you haven't seen. Faith is how God wants us to deal with things. Faith, if you've got true faith, then your faith will put your emotions under control. Because the next one is meekness. Meekness does not mean someone who is shy and afraid to talk. Meek is somebody who has their feelings under control. And it's right along with temperance. 
Meekness and temperance. Temperance is, in other words, you don't let your feelings get control of you. It's temperance. You're tempered. You're meek. Why do you have those things? Because you have a connection with the vine. That's the fruit of the Spirit that all of us are supposed to be possessing and manifesting. And what are they again? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. That's what God wants you to possess. That's what God wants you to produce. And that's what God wants you to manifest out of your life. That's the fruit he's looking for. Because if you have that fruit right there, then here's what you're doing. Turn back over there to John 15. Turn back over there. <clears throat> Verse number 8. I want you to look. John 15, 8. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So in other words, when we bear fruit, we are glorifying God. In other words, God wants the bystander to see the Christian. And He wants the bystander to look at the Christian and say, Man, that guy or that girl right there They've got love all the time in their heart. They've got joy down inside of them. They've got peace that I don't have. They've got long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. They've got faith, meekness, and temperance. They've got those things. And what's supposed to happen in is the lost person's supposed to see those things, and it's supposed to make the lost person desire those things. And when they desire those things that they see in you, then here's what's going to happen. It's going to glorify God the Father. That's why Jesus said over there in Matthew chapter number 5, Let your light so shine that men may see your good works and glorify your Father. God wants us to glorify Him through the things that we have in our heart and outside of us. Did you all ever meet that person who has their flower garden by the road and it's beautiful? Say amen. amen. Well, do you know why their flower garden by the road and why it's beautiful? Because they want you to brag on it. They want you to see it. And they want you to see their hard work. Am I, am I right about this now? That's right, ain't it? There ain't nothing wrong with that. Ain't nothing wrong. I mean, if you have to have them brag on you, then you might have a problem. But if you put something on display for people to see and you're proud of it, there ain't nothing wrong with that if it's a display of all your hard work. And that's what God the Father is trying to do. He's trying to dangle us in the air of a lost society and help people to understand. That's what I can do with somebody when I get a hold of them. The fruit of the branch. The flow of blessings. God says if we do all those things right there. If we'll stay connected with Him. If we'll allow Him to work in our lives. If we'll allow Him to cast out the, uh, the suckers in our life. If we'll allow His Word to cleanse us. If we'll walk with Him. If we'll grow in His garden. If we'll stay in the vine. Then here's what's going to happen. Number one is. Look here. Verse number, I got to find it here real quick this morning. Seven. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Say amen if you say that this morning. Amen. So if God abides in us, and we abide in him, here's what he's saying. If I'm the Spirit of God is flowing out of me and into you, and you're producing fruit, then what are you going to have? You're going to have answered prayers. How many of you today would love to be able to get down on your knees or kneel your head or bow your head, I mean, or whatever you need to do and have your prayers answered? Anybody? Would you like to be able to say a prayer and know that your prayer is going to be answered? I know I would. And God's saying that we can do that. 
if we'll abide in Him, if we'll trust in Him, if we'll stay connected with the Father, if we'll walk with Him, if we'll do those things, if we'll stay in the vine, we'll have answered prayers. Not only that, but we'll have, look on down here what it tells this morning. i got to find it again. Look here in verse number 9. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. So what do we see? We see abiding love. Abiding means continued, is what it means. It means to continue. So here's what we see. We see God the Father. Jesus loved God the Father. God the Father loved the world. You believe me on that today? What's John 3.16 say? For God so what? Loved. loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. So the Father loves the world. The Son loves the Father. And what Jesus is saying is, is if we abide in Him, if we allow God to cleanse us, if we allow God to be the gardener of our souls, then here's what can happen is this right here, is the love of God will flow through us. And if we've got the love of God flowing through us, it'll help us to love God. Now remember, Jesus Christ said, Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind. Those first four commandments up there, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make thee any graven images. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. That's your relationship with God. And what Jesus is saying is, is if you'll place your hope and your faith and your trust in me, and you'll allow me to work in you, you read and stay in my word, then the Spirit of God's going to flow in you, and loving God's going to be possible for you. And then if you love God, you'll be able to love your neighbor. But if you don't love God first, you won't love your neighbor. You won't love them properly. You may have a form of love, but it won't be God's love. God says, love me, and then you'll learn to love your neighbor. And what did Jesus say if we love him and we love our neighbor? He said that will fulfill the law. Those last six commandments, honor thy father, thy mother, thou shalt not kill, commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. I said, thou shalt not commit adultery. Those six right there is your relationship with mankind. If your relationship with God is right, then your relationship with man will be right because the God, the Father, has the love that comes through the conduit of, that's the flow, the thing that allows flow, the conduit of the vine, which is Jesus Christ. And what happens is, is the Spirit of God, Jesus is in the Father. We're in Jesus. And the love of God flows through the love of the Son, flows through the love of us. And it manifests itself down through us. If you want to know how to love God, and if you want to know how to love your neighbor, then love the Lord. Abide in Him, and you'll have abiding love. If you want to go to a church where people love each other, if you want to be the kind of Christian that loves other people, then by all all means abide in the vine. And lastly, you'll have joy. Praise God. We need some joy today, don't we? Amen. We need somebody got some joy to get on Facebook. Yes. Amen, Brother Joe. That's good preaching. <laughs> I had to say it myself. Nobody else is going to. We need somebody in this world to have some joy. Joy. That means happiness because of an expectation of something that's coming. In other words, the reason I've got joy is, is because I'm expecting something. Good. Joy doesn't mean that I'm some kind of laughing, hooping, hollering idiot. Joy, I may do that sometime, but it doesn't mean that I'm doing it all the time just because of no reason. Joy means that I've got happiness inside of me. See, happiness is the fruit of joy. 
I've got joy inside of me because I'm believing that everything is going to be okay. I've got happiness over future expectation. How many of you know that you can get out of bed in the morning and you can be happy? My wife, she don't believe that. She knows what she got to look at every morning. <laughs> but you can get out of bed and you can be happy. You say, Brother Joe, how can I be happy? How can I have joy? Because today, y'all help me here with this. Today is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. You can be happy today, each and every day of your life, knowing that you get up out of bed and you can expect something good to happen because you're walking with God. How many of you know that you can even have joy in your times of sorrow because you're expecting God to do something in your life. You're expecting God to bring you through it. And joy helps us to do that. An expectation of happiness. How many of you know today that you can have joy in the future because... Praise God, you know that Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary. You know that He hung on a cross. You know that they put Him in the ground. And three days later, He come out of the ground. And He was resurrected by God the Father. And I put my faith, my hope, my trust in Him. And I know that even though one day I'm going to die, God's going to bring me out of the ground. Amen. Amen. I get to go to heaven. Amen. I don't have to burn in hell forever. And I can have joy about that. And if that doesn't bring you happiness today, then you need to get saved. Now I want you to notice something this morning. I'm done. I'm about preached out this morning. Look at what it says here. Now I want you to look at yourself this morning. We're going to use this as a mirror. We're going to use it as a mirror, okay? Love, joy, peace. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. Faith, meekness, temperance. Is that you? Is that you? You say, well now, Brother Joe... That used to be me. Remember now, that vine is, in, or that branch is in that vine. At one time, that branch produced. If it used to be you, then perhaps what God's wanting to do today is to purge you. He's wanting to purge you. What's God want to want, want us to, want to purge us from? He wants to purge us. From anything that's stopping the flow of the Spirit. If it's the cares of the world, then God wants to take those cares of the world away from you today. If it's unrepented sin, then God wants to take that unrepented sin away from you today. Cast all your cares upon Jesus. God wants you to be happy. He wants you to be joyous. He wants you to have peace. He wants you to have love. He wants you to have a wonderful prayer life. He wants you to have those things. But you've got to allow him to cleanse you, to help you. So this morning, with a bowed head and closed eyes, nobody's looking around. Everybody's head's bowed and everybody's eyes closed. Some of these little ones may not understand that, but you can forgive them. The head's bowed and his eyes is closed. Can you look at yourself today and say, I've got love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. If you can't say that today, but you know that you used to, why don't you rededicate your life to God today. We're going to give an invitation here in just a minute. And when we give that invitation, if God's trying to work in your heart today, why don't you come up here and rededicate your life to God today?